Hello, and welcome to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. Welcome to February. This month, I'm participating in the Month of Letters Challenge that was started by Mary Robinette Kowal back in 2010. The challenge involves mailing at least one card letter or postcard each day in February, not counting Sundays and holidays. So this really means only 24 days and 24 items. That's not a whole lot for me anyway because I send out probably 12 cards every week just to say hi to people. I'm a big fan of snail mail and handmade cards. In fact, this week I made a stack of cards to send out for the month of letters challenge. Um, besides knitting, one of my other hobbies is paper crafting, especially making cards. And I used to make cards a lot more than I do lately, but I still love doing it whenever I can take the time. So for this week, um, this is the card I made. Um, there's a couple of variations because I use different pattern paper, but I really like this particular paper um, that I used on top because I think it looks like knit stitches, which themselves look like little hearts. And in case you're wondering, all the supplies for this card are from Stampin' Up. They have all kinds of paper crafting and stamping supplies, um, like really nice and thick cardstock, nice envelopes, adhesive, embellishments, and more. Um, I'll put a link below in case you want to check out their website. Um, I also got some new cut flowers this week. They are Alstromeria or Peruvian lilies. Um, I still have my tulips from last week. They're sitting back there, um, but they're getting a little past their prime. So I visited the flower shop and they had some of these Peruvian lilies and they were kind of running low on um, tulips. So I picked some of these up. Um, they were really inexpensive, only like $4 a bunch. So I bought two little bouquets and put them in this, um, this vase and that's what's in here. So like $8 for all of this. Um, and they really filled out since I got them. So um, yeah, so here they are. As far as fiber news, this week I received an order from Knit Picks. I have not ordered from them in ages and I was in the market for an item that I will actually show you in a few minutes. But while I was on their website, I thought I would pick up some skeins of yarn to try that I hadn't tried yet. So I got my first Felici and I know that many of you have already used and are familiar with this yarn. It is a beautiful fingering weight, self-striping yarn, super soft merino nylon blend. It's $5.50 for a 50 gram ball of yarn. So you do need two balls to make a pair of socks, but $11 for a pair of beautiful hand knit socks is not bad. Um, the two colorways I bought are um, Jamboree, which is pinks, purples, and peachy colors, and Toucan, which is turquoise, purple, chartreuse. I'm pretty eager to cast on some socks in one of these colorways, but I'm probably going to wait just because right now I'm in, on, a, on a roll with finishing some projects that have been hibernating for quite a while, but I soon will get to these. The other yarn I purchased from Knit Picks is a value pack of dishy yarn in the Moroccan Dreams theme. Um, this is a bundle that comes with five balls of yarn for $13.50, so it's about $2.70 each. And the colors that you get in this pack are eggplant, pomegranate, silver, kenai, and eggplant, and the keen, or not eggplant, uh, mint. Okay. So Dishy is 100% cotton worsted weight yarn, and I guess most people probably use it for dishes or dishcloths. That's why it's called Dishy. Um, I mean, it feels exactly like the Lily sugar and cream that you can get at Joann's. Um, actually, I think it's a little bit softer, and the colors are just beautiful. Um, so I can get about 
two dishcloths out of one ball of yarn. Um, at some point I'll be on a dishcloth kick again and those are the yarns that I got from Knit Picks. You guys, I'm on a finishing kick this year. I didn't start out with a resolution to finish a bunch of projects this year or anything like that, but that's kind of what it's turned into. And I'm okay with that. Um, this week I finished my third sock project of the year. Now again, I didn't fully knit both socks, but this was a project that had been languishing since about a year ago. These are another pair of plain vanilla socks. I had just started the second sock and when I picked up this project, so all I had to do was finish that one sock and then I was done. Actually, I thought I was gonna have this project to show you last week. Um, I was madly trying to finish the second sock so I could show it um, in the last episode, but I ran into a little sock catastrophe. I was happily working away on it, and then I made the worst mistake I've ever made while knitting a sock. What happened was I knit the heel flap, and then I proceeded to pick up stitches and start knitting the foot. After I'd gotten about 15 rows into the instep gusset, I realized that something wasn't looking right, and it dawned on me that I forgot to turn the heel. I just had a heel flap, but no like cup for the heel. So <laughs> I thought about, well, could I just keep going and make this work? But then I decided, no, um, I'm gonna fix it. So I ripped out like 15 rows and put the stitches back on the needles and turned the heel, redid the instep gusset and finished the foot and now it's done. So this pair of socks is my usual plain sock pattern that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. The yarn is some merino nylon fingering weight that I had hand dyed myself uh, last year uh, for Christmas. I called it modern yuletide because I was trying to come up with a colorway that was kind of Christmassy but something different and so this one has uh, pinks and teals instead of like red and green. I went with a slight variation on that. So pinks and teals and and I knit this project on a US size 1 or 2.25 millimeter 9 inch circular needles which are my normal sock needles. So yeah, um, I have another pair of socks now and I think I've finished a total of five whips this year so I feel like I'm on a roll um, and I'm going to keep going with it. I'm kind of intrigued to see what hibernating project I might pull out of the closet next. This week, I finished listening to an audiobook of the novel entitled The Nicks by Nathan Hill. This is kind of an epic story centering on the life of an English professor named Samuel Anderson, who is a haunted man. He's haunted by the ghost of his mother who abandoned him as a child. He's haunted by a woman that he's loved and failed all of his life. He's haunted by the friend he couldn't save. And he's haunted by the life that he's squandered. So at its heart, the story is about what we do with the ghosts of our past. And Samuel must confront his ghosts one by one. Now Samuel has not heard from his mother, Faye, since she walked out on him when he was 11 years old. Then 20 years later, Faye suddenly gains notoriety for, a, for viciously attacking an ultra conservative presidential candidate. The incident goes viral and everyone's talking about it. Faye's lawyer contacts Samuel and asks him to serve as a character witness. But a book publisher has a more lucrative idea. He wants Samuel to investigate his mother's past and write a scathing expose about her. So through her attorney, Samuel finds out where his mother lives and contacts her. He wants to know 
of course, why she left him, what she did for the past 20 years, and how his knowledge of her life is so different from what's being reported on the news. But she won't talk to him, so Samuel is determined to find out for himself. And so we go back into the 1980s during Samuel's childhood where he struggles with his unhappy parents, a reckless, rebellious new friend whose twin sister he falls in love with. We see that Faye is trapped in a conventional life that she never wanted. She tells Samuel about the Nix a creature of Norwegian mythology who leads children to their doom. She tells Samuel that the things you love the most will one day hurt you the worst. And then we go further back in time to learn about Faye's childhood in small town Iowa, her panic attacks, her relationship with her high school sweetheart, Henry, who she eventually marries and he becomes Samuel's father, and her college days in Chicago. Now, the novel travels back and forth in time from the 1960s to 2011. The Vietnam War protests parallel the Occupy Wall Street movement, and both will bring to mind the heated political climate of today. The story climaxes at the 1968 Democratic National Convention, complete with appearances by Allen Ginsberg, Walter Cronkite, and Hubert Humphrey. There are a lot of subplots and supporting characters in this book, and honestly, many of them could have been left out altogether. My biggest criticism of this book is that it's far too long, too intricate, and too wordy. The book is 640 pages, and the audiobook is almost 22 hours long. Don't get me wrong, I love sweeping sagas when they keep me engrossed, but this book I felt could have benefited from a trim. Still, despite the detours, the story is entertaining and does address a myriad of big social issues like politics, social values, um, media insanity, online addiction, military disasters, academic entitlement, childhood grief, family secrets. Um, th there were some scenarios where you knew, kind of knew what was going on and could predict what was going to happen, um, but there are some you won't see coming. It seems like this book has gotten rave reviews from everyone. I thought it was a big, convoluted story that is good, but not great. So I'm giving it four stars, and the audiobook reader, Ari Fliakos, was good, and he gets four stars as well. And again, that is The Knicks by Nathan Hill. Today I wanted to revisit a topic that I covered in a live broadcast on Periscope last year, and it's a topic that brings terror to the hearts of knitters. And that topic is insects that can harm our stash. I'm talking about clothes moths, carpet beetles, and silverfish. Now in nature, these insects are beneficial to the environment. They live in or near the nests of other animals where they consume shed hair, horns, skin, and feathers that would otherwise accumulate and litter the environment. Unfortunately, sometimes these insects get into conflict with humans because they want to consume their food sources inside our homes by eating the things we value like wool yarn, wool clothing, leather, furs, basically anything made of natural fibers. Clothes moths and carpet beetles are among the rare insects that can digest keratin, the protein that is found in hair, fur, feathers, horns, hooves, nails, and beaks. It's a common misconception that adult moths or beetles eat fabric. In fact, it is their larvae, the tiny caterpillars, that feed on the kinds of items I just mentioned. 
The adult clothes moths and carpet beetles do not eat at all. They basically only live long enough to mate and lay eggs on a food source. Now the larval stage, the caterpillar stage, is only 10 days long, so the damage is often totally undiscovered until after the fact. Now let me start out by talking about clothes moths. Today we have less clothing and carpeting made of wool than in past years, so clothes moths are less common than they once were. The moth larvae are only about a half inch long and are white with dark brown heads. They eventually attach to walls or ceilings to form cocoons, emerging later as tiny pale moths with, with wingspans of less than a half an inch. Adult moths prefer dark spaces, like what you would find in a closet or attic. And this is different than other moths, um, which are drawn toward lights. So if you see moths flying around your house during the day, don't panic. They probably aren't clothes moths. Most likely they're the kind of moths that are attracted to food like cereal, cornmeal, and flour. Clothes moths are not strong flyers. You're more likely to see them crawling on the wall than flying. In fact, if you disrupt an infested fabric, they often attempt to escape by running away rather than flying. And if you do see them flying, their flight pattern is not very purposeful. They just kind of flutter around. So if you find a clothes moth problem in one room of your house, um, you can probably isolate it there because the moths don't fly around that much and are not likely to travel the distance into another room. They pretty much just stay near where the food source is where they'll mate and lay their eggs. In the United States there are over 15,000 species of moths but only two eat wool. The webbing clothes moth which is the most common clothes moth in the United States and actually around the world and the case-making clothes moth, which are actually more common in the southern United States. Both of these species like high humidity. They like to eat things like wool, hair, fur, felt, tapestries, and even taxidermy specimens. They will also eat human foods like meat, milk, spices, and tobacco. Their favorite foods though are soiled wool fabrics like wool sweaters that have stains of perspiration, spilled food, or urine. The most common way moths get into our homes is through a single infested item. Maybe you bought a vintage sweater at a secondhand shop or got an antique wool carpet from your grandma. Be aware of what you're bringing into your house and make sure you clean it thoroughly before putting it away. Clothes moth larvae rarely feed on clean wool. Lab studies show that they don't get enough vitamin B when eating clean wool and many of the components of vitamin B are found in things like perspiration, urine, fruit juice, milk, gravy. Um, so in lab tests when the caterpillars were given only clean wool to eat, um, they died of apparent starvation within two weeks. Other studies show that clothes moth larvae are not attracted to lanolin, um, which is the natural oil on a sheep's body. And that's probably why you don't find clothes moths hanging out on sheep. So as you will see in a minute, one key to preventing insect problems is to keep your stash and wool garments clean. Now let's talk about carpet beetles. Carpet beetles are a more common and often overlooked pest in homes. Um, there are several different types, but the larvae of these beetles also eat hair, fur, wool, leather, hides, horns, antlers, and taxidermy specimens. Basically the same things that clothes moths eat. But carpet beetles will also eat grain, seeds, nuts, pet food, and human food. And lastly, let me talk about silverfish. Silverfish are another common insect found indoors. They are a little under a half an inch long with silvery metal scales on their body, so they kind of look like little fish. 
They also have very long antenna, um, as long as their body, in fact. Uh, they move very fast with a wiggly motion, which also makes them resemble fish. They are active at night and hide during the day, often behind baseboards, door frames, and window frames. They like damp, dark places, especially basements and bathrooms. Now, silverfish differ from clothes moths and carpet beetles in their preferred food. Um, whereas clothes moths and carpet beetles feed mostly on protein fibers, like wool, silverfish prefer materials high in starch and sugar, which are carbohydrates. So they like to eat things like wallpaper glue, book bindings, starch in clothing, and cereal. So what does this mean for your stash? Well, the good news is they don't feed on wool or other animal fibers, but the bad news is that they will eat cotton and linen yarn. So clothes moths and carpet beetles go for the wool yarn and garments, and silverfish go for the cotton and linen yarn and garments. So let's talk about how to prevent insect problems. Preventing infestations of clothes moths carpet beetles and silverfish is much easier than eliminating an established infestation. Um, here are several tips for protecting your clothing and yarn stash against insect damage. First, establish a regular inspection program of all susceptible items at least once a year. This means take all the items out of closets and drawers, take your yarn outside in the sunshine to air out. And while everything is out, vigorously brush each item, especially areas around cuffs and collars of garments. This can be very effective because these insects do not like to be in the sunlight, so if they happen to be on your yarn or garments, they will drop off or be brushed off. Second, for yarn, do not store it on the floor. If you're keeping it on shelves or wire racks like this one behind me, don't put the yarn on the lowest row. Start it one up from the bottom. That way, it will be farther away from the cracks and crevices, like baseboards, where carpet beetles like to hide. Third, vacuum your house often, especially rugs, carpets, drapes, upholstered furniture, pet bedding, um, and under furniture. After vacuuming, always empty the bag or canister because it may contain eggs or larvae. Fourth, clean your clothing regularly, especially before storage. Remember that clothes moths are attracted to articles soiled by food and perspiration, so you want to make sure your items are clean before storing them. Fifth, store items properly. Place clean garments in airtight storage containers, like good plastic bags, Ziploc bags, space bags. Um, they should prevent insects from getting in to your items as long as they don't have any holes in them. Or you can use airtight storage containers, um, like there's some that they sell at the container store. And you could also use regular bins and just put tape over the seams. Um, garments that are completely clean and placed into sealed containers should be safe from insects. If the bugs can't get in, they can't lay eggs. Now, in the unlikely and tragic event that an infestation is discovered in your house, what should you do? Well, here are some tips for eliminating these insects and saving your stash. Number one, the first strategy is again to clean. Thoroughly vacuum and launder the affected items. If they're too damaged, just throw them away and get rid of the problem that way. Second, another easy strategy is to subject the affected items to heat and cold sequentially. I know some people put their yarn in the freezer, but this by itself will only slow down or halt insect activity. It doesn't usually kill them. For example, Clothes moths have lived for long periods of time in unheated barns and attics exposed to below freezing temperatures. So although lower temperatures slow down or temporarily halt their activities, it doesn't usually kill them. You have to alternate freezing with heating. 
So start with heating the yarn or garment in the oven at a temperature of at least 120 degrees. Then put it in a sealed plastic bag and freeze it for several days below 18 degrees. Number three, dry ice fumigation is another technique that can be effective. But if you use this, be sure that you wear gloves and don't touch dry ice with your bare hands. So what you do is get a big 30 gallon garbage bag and one pound of dry ice. Put the affected item in the bag with the dry ice. Seal the bag loosely until the ice evaporates. Once the ice is gone, then seal the bag tightly for three to four days. And this should kill any pests that might be infesting your yarn or garment. Fourth, you can get pheromone traps for under $20 on Amazon. These are sticky strips that emit mating pheromones, which lure the male clothes moths. Now be sure to get the ones for clothes moths and not pantry moths because pheromone traps will only attract the species they are designed for. They are not interchangeable. I bought a box of these traps on Amazon just to show you how to set them up and how they work. So in this box, you get two of these little um, cardboard tents and two pheromone lures that are little round pieces of wool. Now to set them up, the first thing you do is remove the wax paper from the inside surface of the trap, which exposes a sticky surface. Then you take one of the round wool pheromone lures out of the package and place it in the middle of the sticky surface on the trap. Then fold the cardboard into a triangle shaped tent and secure it with the tab so it stays together. Place the trap where there may be clothes moth activity. The company suggests putting one on the floor and one on a shelf in your closet or any rooms containing wool, fur, feathers, anything that the clothes moths like to eat. Other locations you might put traps would be next to the baseboards, in corners, and in other dark areas. The adult moths will be attracted to the pheromones emitted by the trap and get stuck on the sticky film and the idea is that once you have the adults trapped, they won't be mating and subsequently laying eggs on your items. You can also get the same kind of sticky traps for carpet beetles. And again, make sure that they are specifically for carpet beetles and not other kinds of insects. And they even make sticky traps for silverfish. I think those are just a sticky cardboard tent with no chemicals on them. Fifth, because these insects often hide in dark crevices, like along the bottom of your baseboards, one tip is to sprinkle boric acid powder to that area. It, it is a drying agent which makes the environment less comfortable for those type of insects, and it's also toxic to them. You can buy boric acid pellets or powder, which work really well to combat not only these insects, but also others like cockroaches. I'll put links to all the products that I've talked about in the description box below, so you can check them out if you're interested. Now, you might be wondering about using cedar or lavender as a means of controlling or preventing these damaging pests. And I'm afraid the answer is not so much. Research shows that these supposed repellents are not that effective. Cedar oil will kill small clothes moth larvae at very high concentrations, but it doesn't kill adults, it doesn't kill eggs, and it doesn't kill older larvae. Even cedar chests are only good when they're tightly constructed to physically keep out the insects, not because of the cedar oil. So the, the type of wood is not important, it's the construction of the box. Cedar wood loses its essential oils over time anyway, so any protection would eventually dissipate. But hey, if you want to use cedar blocks or lavender sachets just because you enjoy the scent and it makes you feel better, then great. But just know that it's probably not doing anything to protect, <laughs> to protect your stash or clothing. Along those lines, I got this cedar sweater box from Knit Picks. 
I saw these on their website and uh, quite a while ago and I've wanted to get one to just see what it's like. Um, I know you can get similar ones on Amazon. So this is the large one from Knit Picks and it fits a sweater inside of it. The dimensions are about 14 and a half inches wide. So 14 and a half inches wide by about 12 and a quarter deep and three and three quarters inches tall. Now, if you have modular storage, like maybe a wooden version of my wire yarn storage system behind me, the large box will not quite fit the width direction, but it will fit in one of those cubbies if you insert it sideways. It might stick out a little bit in the front though. But you can stack these on open shelves too. Um, they also sell other sizes that are smaller. Knit Picks has, I think, two smaller sizes. And Amazon has a bunch of different sizes of cedar boxes. Um, some of the ones I saw on Amazon were specifically for things like socks. So if you're really interested, I'm sure you could find something that fits what you're looking for. The boxes are nicely made with smooth, smooth cedar sides. Um, the cedar is not treated, so you get the scent of it. it smells really good. Um, it's not really strong though. Um, but the bottom, the bottom, and this is typical of most cedar boxes in my experience, the bottom is usually not made of cedar. It's made of some other kind of wood. I think it's maybe pine because that's a pretty inexpensive wood. And I guess when they manufacture boxes like this, it's common to save money by only putting the cedar wood around the sides and on the top if they have a cover. But the bottom is a lot of times um, just a panel of inexpensive wood like pine or poplar. But it's nice, it's a nice box to put a sweater in and you can stack them. I think it's a great organizational tool and I actually might buy a few more of them for that purpose. I mean, they would look pretty in your closet, but it is not gonna save your clothes from insects. What is going to save your clothes is keeping them clean and not putting clothing that you've worn back in your closet. And finally, what about mothballs? Well, the experts advise against using mothballs because you're basically storing your clothes with a pesticide. Mothballs are a fumigant and must be used in a, an enclosed space, such as a storage container with a tight fitting lid. Yes, mothballs will kill the moths, but the ingredients in mothballs are also harmful to humans. They contain carcinogens and show negative effects from inhalation. A lot of people also use mothballs improperly. They just open the box and set it in their closet. Um, putting mothballs in a closet will not kill moths and will actually pose a risk to anyone entering the closet and breathing the fumes. So if you're set on using mothballs, wear gloves when handling them and place the mothballs between large sheets of paper on top of your garments in airtight, sealed, non-plastic containers. Remove anything plastic from the container, like hangers or buttons on a sweater. Um, the chemicals in mothballs can react with plastic and ruin the buttons or even fuse them to your sweater or even melt the sweater or melt the plastic in a bin so your sweater sticks to it. Keep the container at room temperature for at least a month. And before wearing or using the items stored with mothballs, be sure to wash them and air them out thoroughly. But honestly, why would anyone want to go through all that? Calling a professional exterminator is better if your bug problem is that bad. Okay, so the take home message here is that the danger to your stash from insect pests is probably not as great as you might have feared. So if you want to store your yarn out in the open, if you don't want to keep it in bins, but you've been doing that because you were nervous, I'm telling you, go ahead and free the stash. I used to keep all my yarn in plastic bins, but for the past probably eight years, I've put it on display here in my craft room. I thought, why can't I do that? 
Yarn shops have all their yarn out. And for myself, I find that seeing the yarn I have is inspirational and I have a better handle of my inventory. Being constantly reminded of the yarn I have makes me more mindful of what projects I might want to make. So if you're the kind of person who dreams of having their stash out in the open, do it. If you feel more comfortable keeping your stash in plastic bags, then that's great. I just want to let those of you who want to display their stash know that the threat of damaging bugs is probably not as bad as you might have feared. So hopefully you feel a little better after finding out all the facts about clothes moths, carpet beetles, and silverfish. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the reality of stash damaging insects. Let me know if you learned anything new. Also, please feel free to comment if you have any questions about today's show or if you have an idea for what you'd like to see on future episodes or if you'd like to see a product tested. I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I'll see you in the next video. Next time I'll be talking about knitting with yarn from some of the rarest sheep breeds in the world. I'll have some yarn on hand to show you, and I'll also be telling you about these interesting sheep. So be sure to join me next week. In the meantime, have a sparkly week. <laughs>